Welcome, welcome all to tonight's offering of the Tell It Slant Poetry Festival, brought to you by the Emily Dickinson Museum. My name is Brooke Steinhauser, Senior Program Director of the Emily Dickinson Museum, and I'm a few words about this Zoom platform. So in this format, the best way for you to engage with us is uh, with e and with each other is through the chat feature. You can begin now, if you would like, by chiming in to tell us where you're tuning in from. And the chat is a great place to put in your words of encouragement for these poets tonight and to connect with your fellow attendees. But if you have a question for the poets that you'd like to pose to them at the Q&A portion at the end of the evening, we are going to ask you to type that into the Q&A feature, which you can find in your Zoom toolbar. And you can place questions in there at any point during the evening. We hope you will. Uh, tonight's program features auto-generated captions, which you can toggle on or off from the toolbar. And so we hope you'll forgive any errors of artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, but we do want to provide that for anyone who needs it. And now let's turn to tonight's panel. Allow me to introduce the three poets you'll be hearing from. Miku Paul is a Wolastique poet, artist, community activist, born and raised on a wild river in Maine. She's an enrolled member of Kings Clear First Nations. She's a graduate of the Stone Coast MFA program at the University of Southern Maine and author of 20th Century Powwow Playland. As a grad student, she produced a one-woman mixed media exhibit, Look Twice, the Wapanaki in Image and Verse for the Abbey Museum. In 2020, Miku designed a multilingual cultural coloring book for Wapanaki children and families called Four Seasons of the Wapanaki. Most recent work can be found at the Atlantic Vernacular, Enough Poems of Resistance and Protest, and Wait, Poems from the Pandemic. She is working on a manuscript about the waters called Nebi, and she has spent more than two decades working on DEI issues in Portland, Maine public schools. Then we're gonna hear from Denise Lowe, PhD, what Dr. Denise Lowe, uh, who was Kansas Poet Laureate 2007 to 2009, and she is winner of the Editor's Choice Red Mountain Press Poetry Award for Shadow Light. Other recent publications are a memoir, The Turtle's Beating Heart, One Family's Story of Lenape Survival, and Wing, Poems, and Casino, Bestiary, and Jackalope. And she is co-author of Northern Cheyenne Ledger Art by Fort Robinson Breakout Survivors. She's won four Kansas Notable Book Awards and a grant from the California, Art, California Arts Council and Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. At Haskell Indian Nations University, she founded the Creative Writing Program, and she now teaches for Baker University's School of Professional and Graduate Studies. Board memberships include Indigenous Nations poets and associated writers and writing programs. And her background includes Northern European and Lenape Muncie Delaware Heritage. She lives in California's Sonoma County. And finally, we'll be hearing from Lucia Langday, who is the author of four poetry chapbooks and seven full-length collections, including Birds of San Pancho and Other Poems of Place and Becoming, an Ancestor. She has also edited the anthology Poetry and Science, Writing Our Way to Discovery, co-edited Fire and Rain, Eco Poetry of California, and Red Indian Road West, Native American Poetry from California, and published two children's books, Chain Letter and the Rainbow Zoo, and a memoir, Married at 14, A True Story. Her many honors include the Blue Light Poetry Prize, two Josephine Miles, Penn Oakland Literary Awards, the Joseph Henry Jackson Award in Literature, and 11 Pushcart Prize nominations. The founder and publisher of a small press, Scarlett Tanager Books. She received her master's in English and an MFA in creative writing at San, Fran San Francisco State University and her BA in biological sciences, a master's in zoology 
and a PhD in science, mathematics, education at the University of California, Berkeley. Lucille likes school, <laughs> is what I'm hearing in that. And she is of Wampanoag, British, and Swiss slash German descent. So thank you so much to these three wonderful poets for being with us. I'm going to now turn it over to Miku. Good evening. I'm Miku Paul, and I'm going to start by reading two short poems, one of my own and one of Dickinson's, that have some interesting parallels in form, subject matter, and style. Even though they were written by a Wenuch or non-Indigenous woman poet in the 19th century and a Wabnaki woman poet in the 21st century. A snail primer. Carry your home on your back. Do not hurry. Reach toward new sensory experiences. Sacrifice moisture to move your body forward. Leave a trace of your passing. Explore new surroundings whenever possible. Travel aligned in relevant time. Seal yourself in when necessary. Wait for more hospitable circumstances. Ingest all nourishment slowly. Live as you are meant to live. 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 The Bee by Emily Dickinson, of course. Like trains of cars on tracks of plush, I hear the level bee. A jar across the flowers goes, their velvet masonry withstands until the sweet assault their chivalry consumes, while he, victorious, tilts away to vanquish other blooms. His feet are shod with gauze, his helmet is of gold, his breast a single onyx, with chrysoprase inlaid. His labor is a chant, his idleness a tune. Oh, for a bee's experience of clovers and of noon. In these two poems, I think you know, there are similarities of the subject matter and also the way we each use some of nature's smallest denizens to illuminate larger ideas. I did not write a snail primer after reading Dickinson at all. In fact, I truly knew little of her work before I was uh, writing this material. And when I saw the poems and did the research, I nearly laughed putting them side by side because to me, they really are so similar. And uh, it seems that over the span of history, we both were aware that there are important things to be learned by a close examination of small things often overlooked my poems don't rhyme or this poem does not rhyme but it's it's a similar length i think and intent we're both using a declarative voice and choosing some verbs quite carefully that carry multiple meanings within the context of the poem itself this surprised me dickinson's language in the b is cadenced differently and it includes more visual elements while my own relies on the title almost to conjure more of a visual, uh, but it's perhaps more sharply focused on metaphor to convey the meaning. In reading Dickinson's work, I have seen a really marvelous expansive rhythm evident in her lensing of the natural world and moving from those tightly focused moments of direct observation, like insects, for example, to a, a really boundless view of nature as empress and the sort of indescribable infinity of human existence. I think we're both maybe seeking to describe something that is difficult to contain with mere language. Both Dickinson, you know, and I utilize lyricism in our work. And in reading 
uh, her uh, material and reading about her life, I, I ended up with more questions than answers around uh, how we might be alike in certain ways. Um, and I, I also wonder if the use of lyricism, it's one of my questions, is somehow more expected or accepted in women poets, you know, that sort of softer side. Um, for myself, I'm in my sixth decade, and I've, I really feel I've sort of stepped into my power and sense of self, so I'm less concerned with what others think about the work that I produce. And I do wonder what those uh, kinds of constraints uh, were in Emily's life and how that functioned. There does seem to me to be a kind of shift in Dickinson's work later in life and that I detected a more subtext or a sort of a clear evidence of same uh, in the work. And again, I wondered, is this shift similar to my own, stepping into one's power as a mature woman? 50 has often been described as the age of wisdom. Or uh, could it just be the trajectory of her work reflects a natural path in the evolving poet's sort of maturation? The next thing I'm going to read is two contrasting poems that are personifications of nature, one of my own and, and one of Dickinson's. And I, I ask you to notice how tone differs markedly in these pieces and one is actually softened through syntax and feels somewhat indirect while the other is really very direct and relies on a certain building of momentum in the energy of the line. Nature the gentlest mother. Nature the gentlest mother is impatient of no child, the feeblest of the waywardest, her admonition mild in forest and the hill by traveler be heard, restraining rampant squirrel or too impetuous bird. How fair her conversation, a summer afternoon, her household, her assembly, and when the sun go down, her voice among the aisles incite the timid prayer of the minutest cricket, the most unworthy flower. When all the children sleep, she turns as long away as will suffice to light her lamps. Then bending from the sky with infinite affection and infinite her care, her golden finger on her lip will silence everywhere. And this is my own poem written for the project Whitman on Walls. Mazida Gdakumik in Dakwut, the whole earth resounds. Do you hear it? The bell that rings morning, noon, and night, soft, aching then louder still sounding in your brain your torso vibrating like a hummingbird's wing welcome to the church of the human family we flock to the mountains the forest the beaches seeking solace gather to sing clutch at hymnals pray for rescue embrace regret coda words to live by the fifth will it be commandment or amendment love thy mother or refuse to answer one book says man shall live out his day the hot scramble leeching tides warm swollen carcasses tossed toward us like crumpled love letters i am no longer alive because you stopped loving me in the right way not to own me, but to let me thrive. Behold, said the homo sapiens, we are the beauty and the horror, the joy and the sadness, the love and the hate, the hope and the despair. I give you this 
Ewigwaset, the mother yells. Her furious voice clangs in fetid air, her ire decibels that pound our ears, landslides, volcanic eruption, earthquakes, tsunamis. Then she speaks Samaquan, water, water, while whole rivers convulse. Heaven pours a tumult of precious element. H2O, buckets and buckets, cubic meters. I'm trying to write myself, she says. Tomorrow I will speak squat, fire. Breathless, exhausted as her green clothing twists into a column of ash. Sounding, joy, warning, welcome, danger, celebration, lost in translation, we are indecipherable. We forget ourselves, pretend we will be good as daily the words fly at us like demented starlings, threatened species, nearly extinct, loss of habitat, death of phytoplankton, air quality index. We are the endangered now, stupefied, reeling like strange puppets, heads stuffed with dusty batting, button eyes and locked stare, waiting for some wiser hand, some greater power to lift us from our own hideous mistakes. We are all particles. Quantum love, stardust that collects itself to become a forest, a lake, a mountain, an ocean, a glacier, a human being. Something beautiful, something dangerous. Emperors and assassins, above all, thieves trampling the garden desperate to find the lost home. The mother knows quantum love connects all things, ephemeral threads that reweave themselves to the eternal web, life, drops of clear rain on a birch leaf, chaining together to move, to move. The water we carry desires connection, speaks in yearning whispers, begs for wholeness. These days, my own ears ring, deep inside a tonal knife. I shudder, it keeps me from sleep at times. Ewigwaset warns, your foot may split as you walk the blade's edge, the good right path, your blood is the blood of all, red, like the poppies, like the winter cardinal, like the glorious sunset that precedes the darkness. Now, the contrasting style, you know, and energies in these two poems almost belies the fact that we're essentially saying the same thing, that nature or what I would call the mother is an all-powerful force that has her own unique form of wisdom and that she is aware and responsive to her domain because her domain is her very selfhood, which holds all in balance and can be loving or punitive depending on circumstance. I think I would add that there's probably no hubris possible in relationship to the mother. Uh, to me, she's the feminine divine that's responsible for all life and holds great love and terrible power. I was thinking about uh, the inception of transcendentalism uh, from 1836, which sort of overlapped with the period of her, her work uh, developing those years what she was writing, and I wondered, gee, what, what were those impacts on her? The notion that divinity pervades all nature and humanity isn't really that far from my own indigenous view of the great web. Um, some people call that animism, but I think there are intersectional places 
and the way we perceive the world and human existence, those things are very interesting to me as a contemporary Willustique poet. Um, it does seem that Dickinson's female contemporaries probably didn't have the same freedom to discuss ideas as men did. Um, and I really find the notion, honestly, that Thoreau and Emerson sort of generated or discovered this way of seeing the world uh, is somewhat extractive and inaccurate. Uh, I do wonder in what ways she may have been able to participate in that discourse. Um, I think, you know, for indigenous peoples, we've always seen the mother sort of in that way. And it's interesting to me that some a mode of thought uh, developed, but then it was sort of attributed really to the males at the time. I'm just going to end with, you know, my issue around uh, the transcendentalists. And well, I have an issue with Thoreau because here in Maine, Thoreau explored a river that is sacred to uh, us the Penobscot and the West Branch. He paddled it and books have been written about it. He had a uh, Wapnaki guide. And it's constantly referred to as the Thoreau Wapnaki Trail. So I find that troubling because of that level of displacement. And again, I wonder uh, what was happening in Dickinson's uh, inner life around these modes of thought and why she looked so much to nature uh, for her expressive work, you know, and maybe it was also a comfort to her. I don't know. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Good heavens, thank you, Miku. That's so much to think about. I, I really appreciate that. And like Miku, I came to Dickinson, um, you, know, you know, not happily. I uh, My poet first publisher really tore apart my next, my second, uh, well, both manuscripts I gave him. And, and then said, you need to read Emily Dickinson and, and write smaller lyric poems when I was trying to have a larger scope. And I'll talk about this in terms of indigenous heritage. I have Delaware is the common term used, and it's um, a lot of loosely affiliated Algonquin bands, um, Lenape and Muncie from New Jersey mountains, and in my family later, Ohio. So I read Dickinson from a perspective that looks to the larger natural world beyond a cultivated garden. What depths, though, Dickinson did plumb with her flower and vegetable gardens. She wrote to a cousin, quote, I was reared in the garden, you know, or more correctly, Dickinson's entire property. One commentator, Jaber, explains an expanded understanding of what a 19th century garden was like in Massachusetts. And he writes, it was common for families to own orchards and small working farms. Her mother was renowned in town for her delicious ripe figs. Her brother and father added fruit trees and handsome conifers to the family property, and both Emily and her sister tended large vegetable and flower beds packed with beets, corn, scarlet rudder beans, asparagus, peonies, hyacinths, lilies, and marigolds. The Dickinson estate, known as the homestead, also included a barn, several acres of meadow, and a small greenhouse. Missing are most foraged plant foods and game animals. Dickinson refers to wild deer, for example, on just a few occasions as one of the animals hunted for meat in the poems, A Wounded Deer Leaps Highest, and My Life Had Stood a Gloated Gun. Other commentators have written about Dickinson's expertise with flora and fauna, especially what was close by her, on the homestead. 
probably a few deer strayed through the outskirts of her property, but her references to deer only occur in the context of hunting, of male occupation, apparently. And this is unlike my own traditions, and I have indeed gone on a deer hunt um, as, as a young person. For both Dickinson and myself, interplay between garden and daily life included more of nature than the experience of most Americans today, who are 82% urban. Dickinson and I both write about the garden, the weather, snakes, the stars, yet we have different approaches when speaking of these, and I'll use deer to illustrate some of the points of similarity and of difference. Both of us understand venison is it good to eat. Hunting is familiar, even in passing references in Dickinson's poem. And here Dickinson speaks from the point of view of a gun. And the poem mentions a doe as a target as she writes about a larger mortal and philosophical concern. And so this is the poem, My Life Had Stood a Loaded Gun, point of view of the gun. My life had stood a loaded gun in corners till a day the owner passed, identified, and carried me away. And now we roam in sovereign woods. Oops, sorry. And um, every time I speak for him, the mountains straight reply. And do I smile such cordial light, open the valley glow, it is as a Vesuvian face had led its pleasure through. And when at night, our good day done, I guard my master's head, tis better than the eider duck's deep pillow to have shared to foe of his, I'm deadly foe, none stir the second time on whom I lay a yellow eye, or an emphatic thumb. Though I, though I than he may longer live, he longer just than I, for I have but the power to kill without the power to die. The master represents the mortal human situation in the role of a hunter carrying a gun, and death is the subject of this poem where the doe, eider duck, and the master all have the ability, or as Dickinson puts it, the power to die. This extended metaphor is about foremost a human realm with the doe as background corroboration. I also have some poems with a brief reference to deer as a food source, and I'll read one of them called Ohio Means Continuously Giving River, and this uh, po poem begins with a quotation from Lucille Lang Day, her poem, Names of the States, uh, from her book, uh, Birds of San Pablo, from Blue Light Press, and I appreciate her permission. So this is my poem, Ohio Means Continuously Giving River. Ohio, from Ohio, continuously giving river and language of the Senecas. My great uncle was named Ohio, the last child born before Kansas. Ohio, vast swamp forests of elm, ash, beech, pin oak, and maples. Elm bark tea, ash wood for bows, beech meal, acorn, su sugary sap. Ohio, to the east, a large cranberry bog covered by water, dried cranberries for winter, for meat of geese, ducks, trout, bass. Ohio, hunting camps on the headwaters, bears, deer, forest buffalo, rabbits, squirrels, raccoons, beaver. Ohio, wetlands produced abundant game even after most sections of the country were farmed, like the unimproved lands of my grandparents in Ohio. The connection of deer to a larger and sacred network of existence differs from the mention of a hunted deer in Dickinson's work as background to the mechanical images of the firing gun, Vesuvian, 
superimposed over the sovereign woods, mountain, and valley. Here is a poem of mine that references the idea that deer are shamans in animal form. And this is an idea that in North America goes back 5,000 years with the occurrence of a cave image of a deer horned shaman figure in Pecos, Texas, found with remnants of peyote. The Native American church, my husband's affiliation, uh, continues to revere peyote and deer an animal that can herald the crossing of thresholds between normal consciousness and raised consciousness. This poem suggests this attitude about deer as agents of the intangible mysteries, and this is called deer season. In an unmown yard of dry grass, I miss the deer themselves, but instead find tamped outline of their bodies and inhale their faint aroma. I see that secret bower they create when they press together all night and breathe. Moonlight speckles their hides. At sunrise, like stars, they disappear, but since they are shamans, their spirits remain. Here, presence of deer is tangible, even as sun brightens. Their scent leaves this haunting. Bent straw delineates fragile glyphs, their stories, and they step backward into my memory. The deer is more than prey here, as, link, as it links earthly existence to intangible sky phenomena. There are more than natural attributes to an animal, low in the Judeo-Christian great chain of being. My presence does not dominate the deer. Instead, they inform me of a larger understanding of existence, a transformation. My husband, Tom Wieso Menominee, told me how as a boy, his mother sent him to play in the woods with the understanding that plants and animals, also relatives, would instruct him as, would have, as though they were human elders. My concerns are more aligned with histories of indigenous people and the land not just to cultivate a garden with the natural world as a primary storehouse of wisdom. Here is Dickinson's poem that more directly shatters on a deer, yet also is used as background to the human world. A Wounded Deer Leaps Highest by Emily Dickinson. A wounded deer leaps highest, I've heard the hunter tell. Tis but the ecstasy of death, and then the break is still. The smitten rock that gushes, the trampled steel that springs, a cheek is always redder just where the hectic stings. Mirth is male of anguish in which its cautious arm, lest anybody spy the blood, and you're hurt, exclaim. The deer's death is secondhand, a story from a hunter and not from her own observation. Yet the image is vivid. Dickinson uses the deer's death throes as a metaphor for death in other guises, the broken rock, the hunter spring trap, and a person dying of tuberculosis with fever, hectic, red cheeks, and coughed blood. The deer's ecstasy of death it's the last moments of intense life. And this is a lesson from this poet about the connection of human experience to rocks and animals. Her lens points inward to human states of mind. The great gift of Dickens' work is the psychological insights, self-exploration and discovery. Her vision has depth within a small field of human bordered vision. As a human, I discover my own nature as I read her works, and I am grateful. I look to Dickinson for ways to use the language and for ways to become a more whole human being. One of her best known poems is about grief and it comforts as it instructs. And this is the poem, After Great Pain, A Formal Feeling Comes by Emily Dickinson. After great pain, a formal feeling comes. The nerve sits ceremonious like tombs. The stiff heart questions, was it he that bore? And yesterday 
or centuries before. The feet, mechanical, go round of ground or air or aught, a wooden way, regardless grown, a quartz contentment like a stone. This is the hour of lead, remembered if outlived, as freezing persons recollect the snow, first chill, then stupor, then the letting go. The great lesson of Dickinson is the letting go, setting aside a personal ego, and she has an open heart for lessons from the loss of nature distilled within her homestead. She reaches two natural objects, ground, air, wood, quartz, stone, lead, freezing weather, snow, to describe the, the, the state of depression and the use of nature-based tropes is what we have in common. And in the final line, it's receptivity rather than domination is a place where my indigenous Lenape Muncie perspective feels a compelling infinity. Thank you. Katapatush, uh, Denise, thank you for those wonderful poems. Both yours and Emily's are totally amazing. And it's just, it's so much to think about. Um, I'll start out by saying I am speaking today from Oakland, California on unceded Chechenyo Ohlone land. Um, I also want to say Katapatanamu, that's I thank you everyone for being here, everyone in the audience and also everyone at the Emily Dickinson uh, Museum for organizing this festival. So uh, my name is Lucille Lang Day. Um, I have been in love with Emily Dickinson since I was in elementary school. When I read her poems, I certainly liked them better than nursery rhymes and even better than Dr. Seuss. And she was my first inspiration to become a poet myself. Um, so what I am going to do, we're, we're going to be, I'm going to be talking about landscape and I'm going to read two poems from my poetry collection, Becoming an Ancestor. Um, the the landscapes uh, in in my the, my two poems are further east from from Amherst on Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard. Uh, Wampanoag means people of the first light uh, or people of the dawn. So we're the tribe closest to where the sun comes up. And uh, Emily's landscapes are a little to the west, but there are a lot of of commonalities in our poems. Um, uh, before I read my first poem, I'll, I will tell you just a, a bit about my Wampanoag ancestry. Uh, my mother's maternal grandfather was Wampanoag, but my mother's mother died when she and her twin sister were only seven years old. They were adopted by a non-native couple who brought them to California in part to separate them from their, their biological families so that they could fully claim these children as their own. Uh, so my mother was, um, my, my mother didn't have contact uh, with her Wampanoag relatives during my lifetime, but after she died, I decided I wanted to meet the Wampanoags. And so I contacted the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and told them I wanted to visit. And they said, wonderful. And then when I arrived, the first thing anybody said to me was welcome home. And so this is a poem called Welcome Home. Welcome home to Mashpee, where snapping turtles and painted turtles bask on logs in the marsh amid water willows, ferns, and pickerel weed with purple flowers reaching up from the shallows. Welcome home to the place where your great grandfather whispered to trout he caught at Santuit Pond, then sat in a circle and offered his pipe to earth, sky, and the four directions. Welcome home to the coast where your ancestors built Wituash and gathered cranberries, to the woods where they hunted turkey, deer, and bear and to the clearings clad in goldenrods and asters, 
where they danced for 10,000 years. Welcome home, the elders have been waiting for you. Listen to their drums, the beat of your own heart. Take this wampum necklace made from the sacred shell of the Quahog clan. When you wear it, walk through red root and wild lupin, hear the quickening rhythm of the field sparrow's song. And now um, I'm going to read a couple of poems by Emily Dickinson that, that I think resonate with my poem. Um, she has a poem in which a turtle plays a very important role. The turtles um, in the, my poem, the snapping turtles and, and painted turtles are literal turtles, but also turtles are a very important in the mythology of the Northeastern tribes, including the Wampanoags. Um, the story goes that um, the world is carried on the back of a turtle. And the turtle is kind of a hero because when the creator, creator made the world, the creator needed somebody to carry the world. And the turtle said, I'll do it. So, so we're grateful to the turtle for that. And now I'll read uh, Emily Dickinson's poem with an important turtle. So much of heaven has gone from earth that there must be a heaven if only to enclose the saints to affidavit given. The missionary to the mole must prove there is a sky. Location doubtless he would plead, but what excuse have I? Too much of proof affronts belief, the turtle will not try unless you leave him then return, and he has hauled away. So there's a different um, cosmology and a different spirituality uh, in Dickinson's poem from my poem. And yet the turtle is also a hero in her poem. Um, the turtle doesn't try to prove anything. The turtle shows us that we don't need to prove um, what we believe. Um, and also, at first, the, po the turtle doesn't even try to move. The turtle appears stoic and immovable, and yet the turtle does have agency. Uh, the turtle is a sort of trickster because when you're not looking, he disappears. He hauls away, and I like to think that where he has gone is to help his buddy who is holding up the world. And Emily Dickinson's poem, um, besides the autumn poet sing, uh, also has an, an image that uh, appears in my poem, Welcome Home, and that's an image of goldenrod. And so this is, this is Emily Dickinson's poem. Besides the autumn poet sing, a few prosaic days, a little this side of the snow and that side of the haze, a few incisive mornings, a few ascetic eves, Gone Mr. Bryant's goldenrod and Mr. Thompson's sheaves. Still is the bustle in the brook sealed our spicy valves. Mesmeric, mesmeric fingers softly touch the eyes of many elves. Perhaps a squirrel may remain my sentiments to share. Grant me, O oh Lord, a sunny mind, thy windy will to bear. So um, in Emily Dickinson's poem, here we have a, a landscape, we have an autumn landscape, just as we have a landscape um, in my poem, uh, which happens on Cape Cod. And, uh, and we also have the image of goldenrod in both poems. And uh, in my poem, the, the Wampanoags and our ancestors dance among the goldenrods and asters and in Emily Dickinson's poem, we also have Mr. Bryant's goldenrod. And although they're gone because they, they bloom in August and September and, um, you know, and they're, they're gone by early fall, we still see that, that the golden, Mr. Bryant's goldenrods um, when we read her poem. And I think that that image bringing the gold, that image of gold into the, into the poem uh, is important in both poems. 
Uh, now um, I'll read one more poem of mine. And this is called Instructions for a Wampanoag Clam Bake. Wade into Papanesset Bay to collect some rock people, old round stones smoothed by the tide. Remember Moshe, the giant who predicted the arrival of white men. When he said goodbye to the people of the first light, he turned into a whale. Find a place in forest shade, make a circle and dig a shallow round hole for the stones. Most Moshe's friend, the giant frog, came to the cliffs and wept. Changed into a rock, he still sits at Gay Head today and looks out to sea. Before finding dry wood for the fire, your gift from the forest, notice the shape of the hole and the stones. All life is a circle. When the tide is low, gather quahog and sickasog clams and plenty of rockweed whose stipes are loaded with brine. Light a fire over the stones and when the rock people start to glow, pile rockweed on them. This is their blanket. As salt water is released from the stipes and steam rises, add clams, lobsters, corn, more armfuls of rockweed. This is the apinog seafood cooking. Now thank Katanit, who saw the frog's sorrow and turned him into a rock out of pity and taught the people to use the earth, plants, animals, and water to care for themselves after Moshe left. The deer will always make you laugh. The mountain lion take your side. The star people shine on your path if you do it this way. And now um, I'll read uh, three poems by Emily Dickinson that use some of these same images. Uh, the first one uh, is about a stone. How happy is the little stone? that rambles in the road alone and doesn't care about careers and exigencies, never fears, whose coat of elemental brown a passing universe put on and independent as the sun associates or glows alone, fulfilling absolute decree in casual simplicity. Well, in this poem by Emily Dickinson, the stone is alive, just as the rock people are alive. Um, to indigenous peoples, uh, rocks are sacred, just as plants and animals are sacred. Um, and and stones and plants and animals and all of the elements of creation have their, their own spirit. And I think that, at, that um, Dickinson's poem actually captures that. Then the forest also plays an important role in my poem. And this is a poem by Emily Dickinson in which a forest appears and it's addressed to her brother, Austin. There is another sky ever serene and fair. And there is another sunshine though it be darkness there. Never mind faded forests, Austin. Never mind silent fields. Here is a little forest whose leaf is evergreen. Here is a brighter garden where not a frost has been. In its unfading flowers, I hear the bright bee hum. Privy, my brother, into my garden, come. Well, in Dickinson's poem, the forest represents a place of imagination, and familial love. And in the forest, um, in my poem, offers a gift of dry wood for the fire, for the clam bake. And Dickinson's little forest also offers a gift. And in her poem, the gift is that of love and companionship. And then the um, the third poem, uh, the last poem I'll share by, by Emily Dickinson, I'm nobody, who are you? I'll say something just as an aside 
um, that this is one of the poems that I of hers that I fell in love with as a child, uh, and I still love it. I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us. Don't tell. They'd advertise, you know. How dreary to be somebody. How public, like a frog. To tell the, no one's name, the live long June, to an uh, admiring bog. And so um, the frog in this poem by Emily Dickinson is very important. Um, just as the frog, the giant frog is um, important in my poem. Uh, in Wampanoag uh, mythology, uh, the giant frog is anonymous. It does not have a name. Um, and it's turned into a stone. Uh, so it's no it's no longer it's no longer able to um, talk to the bog or to anyone else. Um, and yet and yet it endures. Now Emily Dickinson's poem, is about fame and conceit and the desirability of anonymity. And so the, the frog beca is, becomes anonymous uh, in my poem and, and in the myth. And then uh, also uh, I, in, in both poems, I, I see the elements of in, endurance and survival because um, even though this the frog that that does all this talking in um in Emily Dickinson's poem we don't hear any more from the frog we continue to hear from Emily Dickinson herself so her voice has has outlived the, the voice of that noisy conceited frog and as a, and as a matter of fact in my poem um the, the frog has survived, but in silent mode, because that frog still does exist on Martha's Vineyard in Aquina, and it's, it is still looking out to the sea, and you or anyone can go, can go see that frog today. So, and I think that, I think that Emily Dickinson would, would approve of that frog. And so, um, thank you. Again, Katapatanamu, I'm happy to be here today. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you, both of you. You know, I I am loving Emily and this whole experience with the panel has brought me into a, a greater appreciation. And um, I I love the turtles and the what and uh, what you said. Both of you showed that, you know the word that keeps coming to me is resonance. Um, Miku, can you think of uh, resonance that was in your presentation? Uh, you know I I can like I said I it was very interesting to me to discover all these many across time literally that I was looking at certain aspects of nature in a similar way um, and our circumstances are so incredibly different but then I, I just started asking myself well how do I as a female poet and also as a, an older woman um how is it that I'm entering that relationship with what I write about and how do those, you know, similarities occur? Like, is this something that just is, is something that happens to all of us, you know, mature women and being indigenous and having such a strong connection uh, to the land Um I mean, stylistically, there are differences, but I, it was kind of thrilling to see the, the things that we do that are in, you know, aligned. Yeah, I, I like what you said about, you know, the lyrics, you know, you find yourself using lyrics more 
and and that like she did and and that women poets maybe tend to lyrics lyricism um certainly i i hear lyricism in uh, lucille's work your work my work and um that and i do f feel myself com i i do have longer larger poems like the ohio poem which is more of a catalog poem but um you know i certainly do hear the lyrical quality of like the shorter deer poem deer season and uh certainly i am carried away with today with images from both of you that are lyrical that make my heart you know feel better healing i i, th I just think about poetry as just another way of communicating you know we all know that it's its own language it, it it's almost inexplicable i love the shorthand of it I love the ability of poetry to create uh, feeling and uh, to uh, trigger reflection. You yeah. Know. Well, I, I was just thrilled, you know, anew with Emily Dickinson's poems when I when I reread so many in preparing this presentation, and it was just so exciting to to find the resonances and to see you know, how she's used some of the same images that I've used um, and and to find that we we both had turtle heroes and in our poems and that we we both have gift giving forests in our poems. Um, it was it, 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 you know, it, it was very inspiring to me. It made me just want to go write more poems. Yeah. Well, and reread well, re and reread more of Emily Dickinson's poems, yeah. too. Um, Lucille, it, it really is special to have a Wampanoag woman present in this panel and and in the you're writing about the same place that your people are from is where Emily Dickinson lived. Yeah, that's that's right. And they and they're you know just many of the same species, you know, Amherst is is west of the Wampanoag territory. But there's a lot of overlap in the landscapes, um, mm -hmm. and so a, a, a lot of the same as uh, this, you know, the same landscapes and this, the same plants and animals appear. Right. It, you know, I was just in northern Wisconsin, back in the upper Midwest. And the, uh, the goldenrod and the asters were just in full bloom. And it, when you read those, I mean, I had such vivid pictures of that. And I loved knowing that that was a place for dancing. Are did, any of us did... teachers? <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and Miku, I really loved what you said about close examination of of small things, and you know certainly, yeah, Emily Dickinson was really good at that, and I loved your your snail primer too, and yes. and it, it's yes. and that's imp important, you know, not only in in poetry. This is a different subject, but it's important in science, and so. Um, that the ability to look at small things, uh, you know, it it just is it important in many aspects of of life, and I I appreciated it in those poems. I really did appreciate that with her work. I love the entomology in there, uh, and I I really wonder, like, if I met, could I have been her friend? Maybe not, you know, because it was colonial periods, but. Um, it would have been great because I think, you know, I consider that maybe the three of us would have been simpatico with Dickinson in that way in the relationship and connection to nature and how we are exploring it and, and describing it and finding those deeper lessons that are inside of it. Um, I really loved that. And I do think that that was one of the things we maybe 
don't necessarily notice in her work. We say, oh, she wrote these lovely poems about the, but the bigger idea is the lesson that we all receive in look more closely and consider. Yes. You know, and that's a big lesson and we all need to do that. And even now in our relationship uh, with green space and urban centers and our relationship with nature and uh, a lot of times we sort of look at this sort of uh, environment, this backdrop, and we forget to notice what all the pieces that create that totality. So mm-hmm. I think that was another one of her gifts to people. Yes. And I'll say something. I'll add to your B poem. I love the B poem by by Emily Dickinson that you read. And it happens that one of her B poems is... One of the poems I memorized in, in by Emily Dickinson when I was a kid, and it's very, very short. It goes, the pedigree of honey does not concern the bee. The clover any time to him is aristocracy. And I not only, you know, got get, increased my awareness of Emily Dickinson's when I learned that poem, I also learned the word aristocracy and what that meant and when i first read the poem i didn't know that word and i and I, and i heard it to myself as the pedigree to, of honey does not concern the bee the clover any time to him is aristocracy well so. i think that's really brilliant because of her lexicon it's she she, she was so well educated right but yes. i love the way some of her structures are so simple and she is utilizing you know rhyme schemes at time but you kind of have an expectation and so i think her her structures her the simplicity of those structures belies the complexity of her lexicon right and and the way she utilizes it very carefully yes in every you know the fact that she can be taught to children shows that she uses very straightforward language but boy if you look at the way she curls and and embellishes and uses the syntax and bends it i mean she is just a master of that that's one reason i read her is to and marvel at her it's just beautifully wrought uh language even in the simplest lexicon it it is and children Uh, can understand many of the poems though maybe not all of them but even reading her poems as a as a child I understood that these were were real poems and they weren't just children's poems but they were also for grown-ups and uh, you know and and that excited me and I and it also made me understand as a child that, that the poems I was writing at the time you know when I was eight or 10 years old were the for poems of a child. And I wanted to, and I just really wanted to grow up and be able to write real poems like Emily Dickinson. Oh, wow. and, I, and I never wavered from that. Yeah. I, you know, I, I will say that as much of nature that occurs within her work, it, it is always focused on sorting out human experience whether it's social aristocracy and, and, uh, you know, like it's, it, it does turn back into looking at psychological states in a very sophisticated way for that time, especially. Um, but it does not open and it, but that is certainly one of the focuses, um, just the human world. Well, do you imagine, though, um, that she had turned to her poetry to explore those big ideas because other avenues were not available to her? You know, when I think about the transcendentalists, I told you I was so annoyed with Thoreau because what they call the Wabanaki Thoreau Trail is actually the old Maduktuk Trail down from New Brunswick and passing through Eel River and Green Lake and through to the Penobscot 
all the way down to Penobscot Bay to the ocean. It is an ancient river portage. Um, wow. So I think about like how the male status and presence in her time uh, possibly uh, reduced her opportunities for discourse around that or occluded the the female voice uh, in in that discourse. So maybe she found her her way to explore it through her poetry. Right. And I think she probably discovered, um, you know, a, uh, a lot of her insights in the process of, of writing a poem. I don't think yeah. she necessarily knew it all before she started writing. And I right. just say that as a poet, because that's the way it works for me. Mm -hmm. I don't have everything figured out either for the poem or about right. life before I write anything. Right. And then, and then, but and it's the process that it enables things to come up and come together in my mind. You know, I think of all those letters uh, that she wrote and, and the responses she had to those letters as maybe her outlet. And, and letter writing, like poem writing, gives you, you discover as you write. But I sure am glad I didn't live in that Me time too. period. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I say, I literally uh, was on a deer hunt, you know, yeah. um, as a young woman or youngster and with a gun <laughs> that I could shoot. Yeah. I have, um, I've popped myself onto the screen, Miku, mm -hmm. Denise, Lucille. I hope you don't mind me um, joining you. I, I want, I'm, I think we're all just enjoying this conversation so much. Um, we do have some really great questions for you from the audience. Would it be okay for me to start posing those to you now? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, sure, that's fine with me. Terrific. And thanks so much, everybody who has been putting these questions in the Q&A. Um, so I think kind of jumping off of your remarks, Miku, just now about Thoreau, um, Ruben would love to hear you all talk a little bit more about how Indigenous womanhood informs your personal poetic. Wow. Yeah, you know, like one of the things, you know, I, I did it, get through that tradition is my mother was a force and she did not conform to uh, gender roles. And through her, I got the sense that I had a right to talk and be part of the conversation as a writer and also as a participant in book, the book world, the literary world. And and I, I find my sister, Jane Chabatari also has been, a leader had a leadership role in the, uh, she's vice president of the national book critic circle and uh, a literary critic and she and i just um uh, did not hesitate and to enter into a place where we were often the only women Um, I think that, you know, my work is is changing um, because I, I started writing for extra credit in English class at Old Town High School when I was 16. And we all know that poets have a trajectory, but I think really uh, in the beginning, I didn't have as strong a sense of self uh, in terms of my, you know, being an indigenous poet. Um, I was who I was. You just live it. But really now, I think I, I lens that more carefully. And I, there's more self-exploration involved, but there's also a more confident voice and tone. And I also feel much more capable uh, when I'm revising um, uh, not all my work is, you know, from my indigenous past, but because I was raised by a granddad elder uh, in my community, and I, I was raised traditionally and had like a formal white education, 
um, those two things sometimes, uh, I, I don't know, it's, they sort of bump together. Um, but I think less so now. And certainly uh, as I, I get older, I think there's just a, a certain comfort and knowing of, of, of personal cultural identity so that I can produce work uh, confidently. And, uh, and uh, I feel like it's been important to me to um, include indigenous womanhood uh, as part of my identity. By their other parts, simply being a woman, a woman poet is part of my identity. Um, also, um, being a poet concerned with science and nature is part of my identity. Being a, a mother and a poet is, is part of my identity. And, um, but wanting to learn more about Wampanoag culture and my Wampanoag ancestors and in, including that ha has been important too. Thank you so much for that. Um, another question for you. So um, Myra has posed this question. She's thinking about, you know, a, a very common theme of Emily Dickinson's work is death and, and loss. Um, and she's wondering, is this something that Indigenous people and poetries maybe deal differently with or similarly? Um, any, any thoughts on that? Uh, wow. one, one of the best things I've heard about Indigenous writings comes from Terry Tempest Williams. I had a conversation with her once about the transformational nature of Native writing. And, and I think th that death is not an ending. It's not a shift to um, a, a, a Christian heaven. It is a transformation. It's a continuation. And, and so that's what I hope to do with poems is to transform the reader, to have an actual experience of transformation that, that gives new life. And uh, I see a question there. Somebody has has asked me if I if I feel that I had to break away from Emily Dickinson's influence in order to develop as a poet, and and you know I didn't feel a, a need to break away from her. But one of um, when I was in my twenties, I joined a group called the Berkeley Poets Co-op, and I when I read some of my rhymed poems, because I was inspired by it first by Emily Dickinson and then I, and then Keats and Edna St. Vincent Millay. And I had read a lot of rhymed poetry and I was writing rhymed, rhymed poems. And um, the people in the Berkeley Poets Co-op felt that I had to be able to write free verse poems too. And that I had to read more contemporary poetry and, and that, uh, and that was good advice. And I don't think, I don't think I've lost that lyrical connection with Emily Dickinson and um, other poets whose work is rhymed. Um, I, I haven't lost it, but in my work, I've I've also gone beyond it. But I sometimes still write uh, rhyme poems. I I I really appreciate that type of poetry. And I don't feel like, you know, with some people at the Berkeley Poets Co-op said, well, all the all the good rhyme poems have already been written. And so you've got to do something else. And I I don't think that was true then. And it's it's not true now either. There are there are lots of good both free verse poems and rhyme poems that haven't been written. I really like to um, formalisms. Mm -hmm. And in graduate school, I, I started with some of those. I got very excited about gazels, you know, and uh, triolets and, mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, I love the idea as an indigenous poet. I see so much narrative poetry out there. And I love spoken word and language poetry. It's a different flavor of experience. Uh, but there's something to me subversive 
uh, about using formalisms uh, to then sort of indict or to reflect back on what has happened to indigenous peoples on this continent. Uh, Langston Hughes liked those poems as well. So I do like, uh, as you said, I like to take the possibility of of these other forms. Um, and then with my content sort of turn things on their head. Like, let me see. Uh, when, when fiddleheads cost $80 a pound, will Indians get a fair price? The chefs and gourmet menus abound with fiddleheads at $80 a pound. The yuppies will search and search all the wet ground and wonder in June why there are none around. When fiddleheads cost $80 a pound, will Indians get a fair price? And that's one of the things that I wrote about mm -hmm, this right. crop, right? That we harvest, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but um, I like doing that. And I also find that when sometimes when you're producing work, uh, it's like a little house that you're deciding how, how you'll furnish to step into that framework is almost a relief at times. And it, uh, it's a nice way to produce new work. You know, if I'm feeling stuck, I like those frameworks. Yeah, and I've sometimes found, yeah, a poem that just isn't working in free verse and it just goes rambling and goes this way and that way. And it's not coming together. And, and I put it into, I make it into a sonnet or a villanelle and, and it works. Right. So some poems just want to be formal poems. Yeah, you know, I agree. There's a paradox that if you accept a certain limitation and boundaries in what you're writing, that it frees your mind in other directions. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Because when you're looking for that rhyme, sometimes a word that never would have occurred to you otherwise just right. pops up. And I think that brings us back to Emily Dickinson. Well, and that's, that was my next question yeah. for you, Denise, um, is, you know, both both you, Denise, and Miku um, mentioned that, you know, as, as young readers, you, you felt a kind of maybe resistance to Emily Dickinson initially. Um, and I guess I, I am wondering, you know, what was that about? Was that, was some of that about the formal characteristics of her work? Was it her language? Was it her identity? Um, and I'm pairing this with a question from Kate, who is curious about what other early poetic inspirations you may have had other than Dickinson. Okay. You know, it's complicated because I, I grew is. up and it wanted is. reading the Black Mountain poets and and being close to them in proximity. Uh, Gary Snyder was a big influence of the Beats. And I know. <laughs> but and and so I was Charles Olson was important to me. The, the larger scope, and I'm putting out a book now that is a book length treatment of the geolo geography and culture and sorrows and theologies of a massacre of Delaware people Fabulous. at Gnadenhutten in 1782. And, and so it, it was sort of like being told to go back to the kitchen and do the dishes. To, to do lyrics. And now that I'm more mature, I respect the lyric, and, but I had to go a long way around to overcome my resistance to it. Right. I mean, I just wanted to be outside. I was taken <laughs> out of school for days at a time to be on the Penobscot River to get my other education, but uh, you know, the, the things that I was forced to do in school uh, here back East, you know, there's, you're learning the Western expansion, you're learning the Western canon. And so my resistance around that was that it felt so irrelevant to me. And it felt like I was being sort of something was being forced upon me when really all I wanted to do was go outside like Emily Dickinson and look at a bee, you know, <laughs> um, I didn't want to have to learn these things that were really so very different from my lived experience. And, and that gets to another, this, this idea of learning and what we're taught gets to another question that's, that's in the chat that wants to know if, um, 
if any of us have been teachers. And I have um, not had a position as a poetry teacher, but I have made many classroom visits, both for children and to adult poetry classes and workshops where I've led workshops with them. I've also taught at a writer's conference, but my only actual paid teaching positions have been in uh, chemistry, biology at a, at a community college, and also uh, as uh, teaching health education for teachers at um, in a, a program for at a four year college for people getting their teaching credentials, and and uh, some people think that has nothing to do with poetry, but actually it does because. Um, science is a, is an important source of of inspiration for me in poetry, just as my indigenous heritage is. And I know Denise has had vastly more teaching experience than I have. In, I, I yes, I I taught uh, at Haskell Indian Nations University for twenty five years, which. Um, and and also at the University of Kansas uh, as for seven years, as as a part timer. So I I have a lot of experience with that. But I I also think of teaching as a creative process where I learn from my students. I I have some some of the formal rules of you know, to, to impart, but it's, it's a discovery that we all participate in. Yeah. You know, I've taught, uh, I did teach at UNA for a while and I found it was a time and energy suck university of new England. I just couldn't do it. Um, but I do a lot of sort of ad hoc work, uh, and I've worked with the Boston, uh, Native American center for rise up for, uh, teaching uh, workshops on women writing trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and I've worked with the Wabanaki Writers Project where I was working with some kids for through adults and older people, um, which was great fun uh, doing uh, rangas. Most recently I did for the Portland Museum of Art for Earth Day, I, I made a tree, a foam core tree. And then I worked with kids that came in and we talked about a tree is home. And hmm. if I was a tree, what would I be? And so then I took every line where we interviewed the kids as they were doing art. And I stacked the lines to build the trunk of the tree and make a poem. Um, so there are a lot of fun things you can do outside of formal classroom instruction as well. I think that question to all of you just demonstrates what we are all feeling tonight, which is that you you have so much to teach, and we have really appreciated being getting to be your your students tonight in your in your classroom. Um, I think we have time for one more question, so I'd like to pose this one from Gwendolyn. Um, she says, "I've noticed that a few poets now are beginning to acknowledge the unceded land on which they live." And she says, "If we also choose to do this, can you recommend a way to do it that demonstrates?" deep respect. You know, that's something I have strong feelings about is that a land acknowledgement is appropriate, but if it's truly sincere, it includes some action items, some ways that the speaker or the organization is actively contributing to <laughs> indigenous peoples and ideally with the immediate community where it's located. Yeah, I think you're right. It should be definitely place specific. And I get a lot of requests like, would you do one? Uh, and, you know, I explain to people, well, it's not up to me as the Skijin woman to do your land acknowledgement. Uh, you're here in this space that really was ours in so it's up to you to acknowledge that you are sort of existing in the space that uh, has been ours for a very long time. In Maine, the Wabanaki people have been here for, I guess, maybe 12,000 years is the archaeological evidence. Uh, so with the land acknowledgement, we know it was 
an old practice when moving through the territory of other community groups and tribes to acknowledge that you are present in their territory. So having it be site specific um, is important. And I really love the idea of attaching an action to that, Denise, I hadn't thought, but you're right. So right. Yes. Yes, and there are, there are a couple of ways you, we can do it here um, for the Ohlone's. And one one is that there's an organization um, that collects a Shumi land tax. Um, and by, by paying that tax or just making a donation to the organization, you're helping them reclaim land that... Um, that they will put to a, a, a different purpose. They're they're not going to cut down the few remaining redwoods or um, abuse the land uh, as the the Caucasian European population has has traditionally done. But they want it back so that they can um, restore it in in some cases and use it for sacred purposes. And so I I donate to that organization. Um, and then another thing is to uh, is to uh, patronize the the businesses run by the local tribe. And so we do um, here in in Berkeley, we have a Loney Cafe um, that is based at the, on the UC Berkeley campus, and they serve. It's run by two Ohlone men, and they they serve all traditionally Ohlone food. Uh, and I do, and I I. I I haven't been able to get a ticket to go there. You have to get the tickets in advance now since the pandemic and they were closed for a while, but I am keeping my eye on their website because I definitely want to go there and support what they're doing. Well, thank you so much for answering so many questions from our audience. Thank you to our audience for such excellent questions. Um, this has just been a very, very thought provoking and inspiring evening with you all tonight. And I wanna thank our panelists here, Miku Paul, Denise Lowe and Lucille Langday for all that they shared with us. You have led us through landscapes that were stewarded by many long before Emily Dickinson by the Pecumtuck Nation and the Norwood people of Amherst before she and her family could benefit from the oppression of settler colonialism. And tonight you invited us to reconsider her words and her work when we keep these indigenous contexts in mind. So we're so grateful to you for that gift. And um, thank you to all of you who have joined us for this event um, around the world. It's been an honor to be here with you. And hey, this is Wednesday, which means we have four more days of the Tell It Slant Poetry Festival, bringing you the Emily Dickinson Marathon, workshops and poetry readings and more. Tomorrow evening, we will be back with the special festival edition of the Phosphorescence Poetry Reading with our friends from the Common Literary Magazine, featuring Aldo Emberan, Ron Welburn, and Catherine Esther Cowley. Oh, Welburn. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, they're going to be online tomorrow, the same space. Okay. Yeah. The festival would not exist without you, our friends and supporters around the world. So if you haven't had a chance to make a donation yet to the festival, we'll pop the chat in the link for you. We like to keep this event free for years to come. Thank you again so much to you, Poet, tonight for being with us. Good night, everybody. Absolutely.